Abkommen mit ähm, äh, hat äh, sich in einem äh, IRC-Chat über Progressive Rock, äh, so aus Google und Musikgruppen, äh, getroffen und haben gemeinsam Interessen festgestellt äh, an Progressive Rock eben und haben sich äh, haben beschlossen, mehr zu diskutieren und haben angefangen, über Softwareentwicklung zu diskutieren und haben dann daraufhin ein Projekt zusammen gestartet, aus dem die Lohn erwachsen ist ähm, und haben sich das erste Mal getroffen, als Plon fertig war, für sowas, als der erste Release von Plon fertig war, äh, auf, ich glaube, es war in Taikon irgendwo im Süden der Vereinigten Staaten. Und da haben die beiden sich das erste Mal äh, live äh, vor Ort getroffen. Und das ist äh, nicht nur ein Beweis dafür, dass zwei Personen äh, unglaublich produktiv sein können, sondern auch, dch, dass auch die modernen Kommunikationsmittel, zu denen sie arbeiten, sie ihnen ermöglichen, so, so äh, produktiv zu sein. Und ich freue mich besonders, äh, dass er sich die Zeit genommen hat, uns heute seine Ideen zum Clone Deployment vorzustellen. Ähm, Erwin selber macht in letzter Zeit weniger Clone, ähm, obwohl sie als äh, mit F und die Firma, wo er Chef ist, äh, noch sehr viel Clone selber äh, machen, aber er selber ist nicht mehr der große Clone-Entwickler. Er entwickelt mehr mit A. Mein Lieblingswort ist auch ein Kurs, eines der wenigen Worte, die meine äh, Tochter aussprechen kann. Das ist auch nicht so alt. Ähm, und das ist ähnlich wie Cotti ein äh, Mikro-CMS oder ein, ein auf äh, Pyramid aufgesetztes äh, Framework, auf dem dann ein CMS entwickelt werden kann. Und äh, ist, äh, mit, Enfold des, äh, mit Enfold Systems sind sie auch äh, Provider von äh, wie heißt es? Cloud. Cloud, der Cloud äh, Deployment Plattform für Cloud, also wenn Sie noch nie äh, ausprobiert haben. Gehen Sie auf cloud.com und holen Sie sich einen kostenlosen Account und wir haben innerhalb von 30 Sekunden eine eigene laufende Cloud-Instanz im allerneuesten Stand mit allen oder vielen sinnvollen Add-ons. And now, the further, without further ado, I, uh, I was just introducing you and I didn't say anything about you, so. <laughs> Thank you. You don't have to be angry. Um, we're going to switch to video after he says hello to, uh, to, to the slide after he says hello to me because otherwise maybe the, the uh, connection. connection will suffer. Uh, thank you, Alan, for being here and uh, you're listening. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've been uh, just getting back from New Orleans, so my... I think my brain is in gear. Uh, this talk will be in English, and I will be talking mainly about a few, a few deployment experiences that we've had. Um, it will be uh, sort of between beginner and intermediate uh, for, uh, for technical audience. Uh, I think that what I'll be talking about um, may be new for some people, but uh, it may be a rehash for others. And since I'm not there, I won't feel bad if you get up and leave. Uh, but let's get on with the talk. And uh, I, I hope to have some time for questions, uh, because I think that that is one of the most important aspects of these conferences, is for not only you guys to, to uh, be able to ask questions uh, uh, at breaks and, and after the conference, but also to the speakers. And, and please remember to, you know, ask lots of questions. Everyone loves answering questions, and there's no such thing as a stupid question. All right, so on to the presentation. All right, so um, thank you guys for, uh, for, for showing up. Um, I wanted to quick, quickly do uh, an overview. I think most of this presentation will be tech technically focused. It's a uh, fairly high level. I'm not going to be getting into really, really nitty-gritty details. A lot of the experience that, you know, I think these conferences boil down to you know, what experiences we're all having so people don't have to feel the pain uh, that other people have had. Uh, maybe some common sense tips that people, uh, you know, it's, it's good to hear from, it's good to hear again just to sort of jog your memory. Um, and some of the common features that we find in, uh, in deployments. 
And really, this talk, I think, is inspired. Uh, the reason why I wanted to give this talk is because Jim Fulton and I, when we were in Brazil uh, at PyCon Brazil, we had a really, really uh, great uh, impromptu talk about uh, deployment processes. And uh, we sort of compared and contrasted the Infold and Zopcorp's different approaches. And um, it, was, it, was, it was very interesting. And Maurizio Damonte, uh also sort of commented on one of uh, the, the, the ideas that I had brought up on a mailing list. And he said he wanted to learn more about that. So I wanted to, descri to describe a little bit more about uh, uh, some of the configurations we've used. All right, so in Plone, uh, there are, I don't have very many pretty pictures. I'm sorry, it's mostly text. Uh, but in Plone today, we actually have two different ways of really configuring uh, in production. Um, we have uh, the, the Z server with a proxy in front of it, which is multiple processes, um, and uh, WSGI, which is, again, multiple processes. Uh, but <clears throat> In, in, in the Z server land, uh, you have each process running. Uh, it's, it's either its parent is either uh, the operating system starting it from uh, an init script, or maybe something like Supervisor D or Daemon Tools or something, which actually hold, you know becomes the parent that forks the processes. WSGI is the, the standard that I believe, I, I looked on the, the, the conference uh, schedule and it looks like people have been talking about WSGI. Uh, we are a little bit late to the party. I think people are starting to deploy it on, on lots of projects now. It's not very exotic for Plone, uh, but it's not yet common enough. And I think that we should, uh, if there's any sprints, there should be some knowledge transfer around that and, and some people... Uh, uh, learning a little bit more about that. Uh, a little bit of the configuration uh, the, uh, in the in the uh, you shouldn't really have uh, more than two threads per process unless you're doing something fairly exotic um, uh, in WSGI and in Z server. The number of processes you have are approximately the number of cores you have in Z server configuration something like supervisor is very useful for recycling clients and mod whiskey uh, it's a little bit different because actually mod whiskey can actually handle uh, recycling gracefully different clients and um, and recycling based on a variety of, of metrics number of uh, a number of, uh, of requests that have been served or etc and then it will recycle the Python process um, and that's quite useful for memory leaks or just sort of uh, unbounded growth in cache. Uh, load balancing is a little bit different. Uh, when you're load balancing onto one machine in the proxy configuration, you will have a front-end load balancer that is external that's, that's connecting to different ports. Uh, in WSGI, the load balancing for a machine will happen inside of the Apache web server, inside of mod WSGI, which will be connecting to the different child processes. Um, a very important part about uh, uh, a very important part about this can, about extending your application is anytime you need to do uh, some sort of um, extension to Plone um, with um, before or after a request is happening. It's a little bit uh, tricky to do in Z server. There's lots of Zope application hooks or Plone application hooks and, and events and and different sort of co uh, contracts to be satisfied to actually hook into the traversal machinery, the publishing machinery. Um, but in WSGI, it is much, much, much more elegant and simple because that's what it was made for. And you simply just, you can find tons of documentation on it. It's any sort of middleware uh, that can be used uh, to, to hook into the before and after request. And of course, you can still use the application hooks. And if you add some sort of relational database such as MySQL, you can say that uh, the system is a real sort of LAMP configuration and would be familiar to those uh, to those who are actually uh, administering it and operate uh, and, and and maintaining it. The there's some good things and bad things about WSGI. Um, the bad is today, at least to my understanding, the WSGI publisher and and the other publishers do not support um, XML RPC. Uh, maybe the infray one does. I'm I'm unsure. Uh, 
when you reload or restart Apache, you will recycle all the clients at once. There's not really a decent way to uh, stagger the recycling uh, that I know of uh, using either reload or restart. Uh, whenever the whenever the processes are running, they'll be staggered. But when uh, when you're actually uh, starting it up, it can it can take a, a, a substantial amount of, of load. Um, another uh, again, you know, pa uh, providing any sort of hook into before or after requires uh, uh, because because there are are events and contracts for before and after. Uh, in the publishing machinery, sometimes existing patches may need to be uh, handled inside of your inside of the publisher. Uh, one of those things would be, uh, I believe, link integrity inside of Plone uh, by default uh, provides some additional uh, hook that you would need to um, uh, catch when you're using uh, WSGI. Most likely, the WSGI publisher supports that now. Um, but we are, I, I know that when we were doing WSGI uh, for some projects, we had to actually manually catch it. And I'm unsure, but uh, could you guys raise your hand? Is anyone deploying WSGI in Plone as of today? Can, can you guys raise your hands? Zero hands. Wow. Okay. So it's really, I guess, not widely deployed. And that is, that's a shame because uh, it actually is. In, incredibly useful um, and, and opens up a substantial amount of possibilities and it would be very worthwhile for people to talk about what, what their, where their comfort level is uh, and why the comfort level is not there with WSGI. The good parts about it is it is widely deployed in the Python community so um, it's as close as we have to a standard um, and uh, providing any sort of before and after uh, connections uh, into uh, Plone uh, uh, using middleware works really well. An example of that is something that we cooked up called infold.static, which uh, which overrides some of the resource registries and actually uh, will compute those and through the middleware and cache them onto the file system. So subsequent uh, requests for uh, for static assets can be served by the web server. Uh, instead of uh, being served by uh, uh, through the actual publisher, uh, the other great thing is, from an operational point of view, it's less processes to manage. Uh, it's really uh, it, it's really difficult if you have a eight or a twelve core machine and you're or or twenty four core machine and you're actually having to manage sixteen, twenty four, thirty two processes on one machine. Um, and then going back into uh, sort of how traffic gets, it, you know, how you're actually segmenting your traffic, we found it very useful at the top layer proxy to put, uh, to identify the type of audience that you're going to be servicing. Uh, on very large sites we've had, we've we found that um, spiders can be very aggressive and you really want to dedicate, you know, if you have, you know, several thousand pages thousands and thousands of pages of content, you know, 50, 60, whatever, you may have spiders, you know, you'll probably have at least five to ten spiders crawling your website uh, almost every minute or every second even. And so it's 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 very useful to put uh, to put a proxy to identify using regular expressions, you know, whether or not there's an anonymous user, an off you know, an authenticated user, uh, some spiders, if it's mobile, there's at the proxy level, we typically segment our traffic using Varnish, uh, mainly because of VCL flexibility. There are different proxies that you can use, obviously, but Varnish is the one that we typically use uh, to put uh, a a request uh, put to, to put to put a header in uh, for downstream uh, uh, pool allocation. And um, and then whether or not it's Apache, HA proxy, or whomever, they typically take this key that determines the audience and, and assigns it to the pool that they're needing, uh, that is that it's optimized for that, that pool. And that actually is a very important uh, part, the working set size uh, between content authors and, uh, and, and anonymous users and even spiders. 
um, is usually a, a, a different type of working set. And so you really want to keep uh, like traffic uh, 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 stuck to like uh, processes for efficiency. Am I sounding OK, Bill? OK, great. Um, thank you for answering uh, answering for him. <laughs> All right, and so uh, a few things about the storage aspect inside of the deployment. Uh, obviously, we use uh, the ZODB, which is an object database. It comes in two flavors. It comes in two modes. Uh, um, there's a read write and a read only. We have uh, today uh, several different storages. The one that comes with Plone and everyone is probably familiar with is file storage and network storage, or also known as Zio. And that is a native Python uh, daemon that will serve uh, database records from a file and can satisfy uh, multiple clients connected. And then there's rel storage, which stores the actual ZODB records inside of a relational database. Uh, uh, you know, again, the, the, the records are uh, ZODB records. They're not uh, atoms or, or primitives for a database uh, such as uh, integers or, or, or strings. Uh, blob storage is, uh, is a mechanism that's supported on both uh, file storage uh, or rel storage, which allows you to serve uh, binary files directly off the file system. And there are three other storages that are very, very useful. Uh, has uh, could someone tell me uh, or raise their hand if they're familiar with demo storage, or before storage, or Zlib storage? Could you raise your hand? One person. Fantastic. So um, these uh, these are actually very useful because uh, the uh, if you don't if you don't know about these tools, uh, you can sort of put yourself into a bind, uh, demo storage uh, will allow you to bring up a, uh, a database and all writes that occur will actually be written to memory and will not be actually saved to the, the, the wrapped storage or the underlying data store. Um, now, demo storage, when you open up the database, the underlying database, that is the snapshot that you see. Any other changes to the underlying database will not be displayed uh, or will not be shown uh, in, uh, after you've opened up the demo storage connection. Uh, before storage is another similar thing to demo storage. It's typically used for um, forensics whenever you want to look at the storage uh, at a given time. So you can open up a, a, a store and say, I want to look at this storage as it was four hours ago. And you will actually, it will not show you all the transactions that have happened after that time. So you can manipulate the system in inside of, uh, you know, as it were at that state. And Zlib storage is something that is very, very useful because since we're dealing with content management and a lot of data is strings, HTML and uh, and, and descriptions and uh, text fields, uh, Zlib storage will actually uh, uh, compress the compress the actual text uh, for the database record. And there's been reported savings of storage space between 40 and 70 percent, uh, and that is. A very, very simple way of configuring a uh, system, and uh, you're not losing any, uh, you're not losing any performance, uh, or it's negligible, and the storage capacity you gain is is substantial, especially on larger systems. Um, and a little bit more, Zio is the most common. Um, the the wrappers, uh, Zlib before and demo, uh, work with both Zio and Rel storage, so you can use these with any sort of storage. And again, uh, there is a, a difference when you're in read-only mode. If a database change occurs, it will throw a database level error, which will show up inside of your application, uh, which is probably not what you anticipated. Um, if you're looking, if if you're wanting to provide a read-only mode for a a user, uh, you could catch that exception and display a nice error message, but again, then you're going into application hooks. 
Uh, the other problem is that if you're looking at other using other people's third-party components or uh, hosting someone else's application, most likely there are rights that are happening that may be subtle. Uh, a user logs in that might cause a write, uh, and there 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 are actually places inside of Plone where it was causing writes um, on a page view, uh, and and that was uh, that was recently fixed. Uh, demo storage would prevent you from actually seeing any sort of uh, exception uh, at the storage layer because any write is just sort of uh, stuck into memory and is not uh, is not propagated down to the, the storage layer. So you can run demo storage with a read only uh, storage where there is you're guaranteed that no writes will happen if you want to be sort of doubly sure or feel really confident about it. Rail storage is probably one of the more popular configurations, mainly because of replication needs. Um, it's uh, is anyone using rail storage in production? Could you show me a number of hands? And how many people are using Zio in, in production? Okay, and so. Um, the there is no I mean there's not a better or worse. Zio for sure is much easier when you're working with um, an internal team and you and 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 you're do, and and everyone is doing the operations. Um, relational databases have uh, have have a few nice uh, niceties when it comes to sort of operational friendliness. There are some key advantages of having uh, the rel storage. One is uh, you can use memcache uh, to store the uh, Zio client cache among multiple uh, processes. So if you if you have uh, many 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 processes, rel storage may reduce the amount of RAM consumption that your your total application is using because you'll be sharing a cache between them. Um, you pro you will need to do tests though because we we had found bugs in them. Uh, we found a bug in that at one point, and uh, that has that seems to have been fixed. And there are no uh, no known bugs that we've encountered. Um, when you're working with, if you have a replication needs, mainly master slave, um, there's a a huge amount of uh, value being able to spin up a, a the complete combination up and running in a few minutes, and that that is very very useful having a, a asynchronous replication and, and very quickly. File system blobs are optional. Um, the big problem with rel storage if you're using file system blobs is that you have to keep two thing, two data uh, storages in sync. You have the file system and you have the relational database. This makes replication management and data man consistency a little bit more awkward. Um, and that is something that uh, uh, you might want to be uh, very mindful of. Um, the only big downside that I see to running a, a SQL server, um, whether it's MySQL or Postgres, is that you have to actually be running a MySQL server or uh, a relational database, and you'd have to have the client libraries installed. But I'm not sure if that's really a downside these days. The package management and the binaries for all the client libraries are, are, quite, sophist are, are quite sophisticated. It also supports read replicas, so if you have quite a bit of reads, you can actually uh, offload uh, your a lot of read operations to a um, to a, a a slave or a set of slaves. And there is a separated prepack and pack. Uh, I believe that Martin Peters has uh, had completed. It's fantastic. It's the most. It's it's invaluable. Um, and the separation of the prepack is if you had a database that has never been packed before, um, which I'm sure, how many people have gone into production or started supporting a customer and they had never packed their database before? Two. And uh, we have one that has not been packed and they've been in, using the database for probably several months, maybe six months. And the prepack operation takes about 40 hours. And um, I mean, if you're locking the database for 40 hours, you would uh, you would kill the system. I mean, you simply couldn't do it. 
the pre pack uh, being able to separate pre pack means that the pack operation actually happens much quicker. Um, pack operations do lock the tables. You cannot perform a write. The operation will block uh, until the uh, lock is released. Um, and it, there is an option to release the 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 uh, write lock on the tables after a certain amount of time. Um, and of course, if you're doing this in a replication mode, you must execute uh, your pack and maintenance operations on the master so that they can uh, so they can actually uh, replicate the changes down to the slaves. Uh, and again, uh, a, a really important uh, aspect of uh, of that is that the relational uh, the, the systems administrators who are who are very familiar with relational databases can manage and, and own that aspect. Uh, binary logs, shipping, and all those things are uh, they're not they they are much more complicated than the network storage, uh, but also they provide a, a, a substantial amount of flexibility. Um, building out, um, I just want to double check. I have until ten fifteen, correct? Twenty minutes, twenty five minutes. Okay. Um, we have uh, when we when when we are building out, we we typically try not to run. Uh, Oh, I'm wow. Did we start late? Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So uh, when when we do builds, uh, one thing that Zipcorp and Infold definitely share is that we typically do not build, uh, build use build out on production. There is a build machine that runs the exact same operating system as the production servers. Uh, you can this this build machine can be a Hudson client, and uh, we typically generate the build out. Um, and execute the build out on the, the 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 Hudson or the build machine, and then compress it and move it, uh, compress it or package it. So Corp uses RPMs. We have uh, we've worked with devs and RPMs and and and, uh, and executables. If you go to packageunfoldsystems.com/docs, uh, you can see uh, so uh, the packaging instructions we have for Debian and, and RPMs. Everyone can use them. Uh, it works quite well. Um, and we've never had a problem actually with that um, ever. Actually, it's quite it's quite reliable. Uh, and also, the system administrators feel much more confident uh, with with those package managers. Plum will never really be in Fedora. We've tried to communicate to different communities, and uh, the system level packages, uh, mainly uh, some of the Zop component and some of the the libraries that we use, are shared across. Um, are shared across system level, and it's uh, it it uh, the most of the packaging systems use system level uh, libraries. So the Plone, you probably won't see Plone uh, in Fedora or any other. Um, uh, it, it simply won't be able to be packaged uh, that way. Then they won't accept a a, a compressed build out. Uh, um, uh, running with hyphen. O is uh, lowercase is is reasonably safe if you're on production that runs it in offline mode, but presumably you've transferred using SCP or, or something to that to that machine. Uh, Windows builds you can grab info.recipe.ino setup. Uh, here's a Google Doc um, that talks about how the Plum Windows installers work. Anyone can uh, customize their own installer and generate an executable. We made it so that the executables are are uh, rebuildable by other people. Um, and most importantly, when you, before you compress it, it's a it's it's a a frozen archive. Debugging is probably uh, is is, an, is another thing in, inside of production environments where HA proxy uh, uh, is is used quite often to generate uh, 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 anal analytics around what URLs are taking the longest. Uh, there's a recipe uh, or, or a, a, a little uh, recipe called build out recipe called collected that stats or a package. Which consumes you install this package, and then in your event logs, it generates extra uh, information, and you can run a script, uh, a, a script on it, and it will generate a CSV file, and also it will inject stuff inside your response header, so you can actually take a look at it and fire a bug, and 
deadlock debugger and variants are still invaluable. Uh, if a machine is spinning, uh, you really you must have deadlock debugger and variants installed. And WSGI middleware could help tremendously in the debugging efforts as well. Um, different ways of configuring uh, the Plone application. There's the default mode where content's on the root of, root of Plone, or maybe you have content staged from a, uh, a editorial area into a, a specific container. Content mirror is uh, it's it it hasn't really been uh, there hasn't really been much development on it, but it still works and it's exactly it's almost identical to how Alfresco works. Uh, Alfresco doesn't really sort of participate in content serving. Uh, content Mirror actually will allow you to edit content. You, you synchronize your clone with a relational database, and then anytime you edit content, it will actually update the database. Uh, and this will actually use primitives from the database, so you can actually query the uh, the attributes. Um, it's not widely used, I think, uh, due to the use case that most people are not having separate web applications from clone. Uh, meaning Plone is not serving the actual web requests, but it is valuable and uh, it is something that we have in our tool chain and uh, uh, our toolbox and it should be uh, uh, reached for if needed. And static deployment is still there, it exists and actually works, uh, but it is an edge case. Some of the performance things that we've seen, Chameleon, by, by, uh, is Malta Bork there? Is he at the conference? No, uh, Chameleon is giving. Oh, okay, that's unfortunate. Uh, he, if it by, I mean, we've done quite a, done quite a bit of work. I think on Randy Young, who should certainly be there, uh, has had some problems with Chameleon. It would be useful to know whether or not he's still having them. Uh, but in in our production environments, we've seen between a fifteen and thirty percent uh, HTTP response uh, uh, decrease. Uh, other decreases that we've seen and we've had to, uh, to optimize out the default nav tree, which if you simplify it, you can get about another 15%. Uh, the green uh, bar on the menu uh, is fairly complex and it's between 10 and 15% of the total HTTP response time. CMS UI should address those problems. The main issue with the actions menu is there's too many adapter lookups. It's just too flexible. And then indexing uh, uh, when you have lots of content authors, you really sort of need to go out of process, um, meaning that you need to defer the actual full text uh, indexing uh, when a user clicks save so they can actually get back to the next page and the full text indexing uh, for the actual binary content or for uh, HTML happens uh, maybe a few minutes later. There's uh, something called Q catalog, which is quite simple. And, uh, and and then there's uh, Plone app async um, and collective.indexing. And those uh, all sort of sit, serve different purposes. Uh, monitoring uh, munin.zope, very, very cool stuff. Really what there are what there is is you have two different sort of approaches. One you have which is pulling uh, uh, snap, uh, 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 pulling intervals. You basically do a get on Plone and you, get a, uh, a a time slice of what the Plone system looks like at that time, uh, every minute or every minute or every, you know, five seconds. Um, so those are pulls, whereas collective.stats and big O logger, which is one of the loggers that ships with uh, Zope, um, actually generates extra information inside the event log, and then you can parse it. Uh, one of the things that is very useful uh, inside of collective stats is being able to see the RAM before and after an HTTP operation. Also, time in publisher versus the traverse and commit time. Are you queuing requests inside of the publisher? I mean, are you you know are you bottlenecking on clients? Then you can quite see easily. Oh, I can add more clients. Maybe I'm I/O bound. I just need to add more clients. And I'm and and if you're I/O bound, you can always add more clients. If you're CPU bound, it's a little bit more difficult problem. Some of the unresolved issues that we have. Content extraction and indexing. iFilter uh, works very well on, on, on Windows. Um, it's in our public SVN, info.plone.iFilter. Uh, if someone has uh, time, you can fork it and put it into the collective. Apache Tika uh, is fantastic. It's what is used in solar. I think that there's a few talks on solar. It would be really great to have some sort of Tika uh, Plone converters um, uh, because you can actually execute the, the Tika uh, converters actually off, the, uh, off a command line. And messaging and ta uh, messaging and task queues um, and asynchronous operations, for instance, for the catalog, uh, 
there's something called plone.app.async. Um, it's native in the sense that you don't have to run uh, uh, any more technology other than what you're running with file storage and, and uh, Zio. You typically just run another uh, another process called a, a worker process, and, or and that has a uh, has a, some fairly big uh, pros and cons. The biggest con is that it's transactional, and if you uh, and a lot of messaging and task oriented things are really uh, don't work very well for transactions. So reaching for it uh, too eagerly is certainly not a great idea. Uh, Carrot and Celery are uh, seeming to be about as good as Python gets, and you should be able to use those uh, inside of uh, uh, Plone without any problems, just like you normally would in any sort of Python application. Uh, one thing you would have to probably be mind. Uh, one thing you have to be mindful of is any sort of conflict resolution that's occurring. So there may have to be uh, a, a little bit of an integration around that. So I wanted to go through uh, two different configurations to show you guys how we solve uh, problems for uh, from some of our customers. This is a um, a, a, a quickly knocked up uh, a, a diagram of how one of our university customers has deployed where on the left hand side you have the authors who are writing to the master database um, and Varnish and Apache or whatever proxies are in front um, and there may be multiple clones and uh, this actual network access is blocked at the IP level uh, and, and, and uh, so you simply cannot access this network uh, if you're outside of uh, certain IPs or you're not VPN then. And then uh, on the right hand side is a separate subnet and uh, there's a hole that's punched through uh, so that uh, uh, MySQL can can ship the logs uh, uh, from the master. And this is a read only uh, a read only database. It's actually not running in demo storage. Uh, it's read only or it could run in demo storage. And the only real difference out of something like this is that you're guaranteed that all public information cannot you you can have you can have no rights to the database. Uh, typically, rights in this configuration are done with a, a relational database or a separate uh, a separate ZODB where you want specific writing rights to happen that are application based, um, and that works tremendously well. Uh, has anyone deployed in this configuration? No, what one has, uh, yeah, it would be use, it'd be it'd be really great for him to hear to hear some of his uh, experience. Um, I would I would definitely talk to him about the pros and cons of it. Um, and so the reason why you uh, uh, the, the 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 main reason for this is that we are guaranteed that we have two separate uh, essentially two separate code bases. We can be a little bit more aggressive with the authoring uh, aspect. And um, and the public ac uh, public access, um, we can um, we can we can ensure that there, it's impossible from a security point of view for someone to write into the actual CMS space. Now, redundancy uh, is a a, a, a prime uh, motivation for one of our customers who's running on Windows. Um, what they're running is uh, a private network where the content authors come in. And, and uh, they work uh, across load balance or actually hits either one of these machines and they use the master database. Uh, the master database is pushed put there by a load balancer and then if that master database ever fails, it goes offline and then everything fails over the, 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 the load balancer will switch to the slave. And this means that the, the slave can go out without any sort of... Uh, Without, you know, if the slave goes out, actually, this, you know, if the slave goes out, um, the, the data on the public side will stop replicating, but it's quite easy to point the slaves on the public side to the master. And then um, if the master goes out, the system will automatically fail over to the slave, and the, the other slaves will actually continue replicating from, uh, from the, the, the passive slave. So it's the master always replicates to the slaves, and the two other slaves replicate from the slave. It's a very common MySQL uh, configuration. And then on the public side, we have, uh, in, in, for this customer, um, we do have some writes that actually happen, but they're inside of a different database. Uh, those writes um, 
and each uh, machine actually runs a MySQL. Uh, so uh, either machine, uh, either machine, or the MySQL service can stop, and uh, they will fail over onto the other uh, the other slave. And there is a uh, a, a, a mechanism in RHEL storage that if you are reading from, or if you're connected to one database, uh, one MySQL database, and it fails for whatever reason, it can actually roll over to another uh, IP and port. So <clears throat> you don't actually have to just use a load balancer, although that is uh, quite useful for a lot of our customers uh, from, from a management point of view. Uh, a little bit about how to deploy that, we use Varnish by Wiki and Apache. Uh, the Whiskey publisher that we're shipping with uh, uh, Zope 2.12 is uh, is what we use with very minor changes. We have uh, a fork of rel storage called Plow.rel storage, which multi-tenants the storage into one relational database. And uh, if you go to uh, Plow.com and create a clone site, you'll see that it's quite fast. These are these are provision these are these are created uh, at runtime. They're not uh, uh, provisioned ahead of time. Uh, and then actually using some of the um, uh, using some of the the middleware. Uh, without the middleware, we would we would probably not be able to actually execute cloud uh, infold static and and then some of the load balancing techniques that we have to use for host names uh, to ensure that uh, we have uh, correct load balancing. And then the cloud.com application you go to is a pyramid application uh, running Vita as well, but you sign up in the control panel. All that is just a very, very simple pyramid application. And when you go to your hostname.plow.com, or your, if you purchase it and you just go to, you know, your hostname, if you use the, the DNS, that is actually going through Mod Whiskey and Apache, but it's actually just a plone, normal plone instance that's running uh, inside of Whiskey. So I'm, I'm, I rushed through that. Uh, if you want to uh, look at any of the software, it's inside of our public SVN. Uh, give Plowed a go. It's uh, you can get a free clone site in 10 seconds. Any errors we see, uh, we fix, and uh, we've probably fixed about 20 or 30, maybe even more than that by now, uh, clone issues uh, that have gone upstream by uh, seeing them in uh, in production. Uh, if you have any questions. Uh, Email me at onlinepulses.com. I'm also on IRC and Runyaga, as well as Twitter, Facebook, and all that. But if you want to contact me, email is always the best. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I appreciated the opportunity to talk to you guys, and I'm open until for any questions for the next eight minutes. Uh, thank you, Alan, um, for this talk. Any questions? We're running a little late, but that's okay because the other talks are also late. And uh, the only thing on the agenda afterwards is lightning talks, and we only have three at the moment, so we're not going to uh, spend the whole rest of the evening here. Question number one, please. Uh, hang on. Uh, with the CEO, is there a mechanism for a master slave configuration? Or does that only work with an SQL database? Someone's going to have to repeat back to me, Phil, what he's saying. I, I can't quite understand what he's saying. I didn't understand the question either. Okay, is there a mechanism with CO that allows a master-slave configuration, or does that only work with an SQL database? Okay, uh, did you get the, uh, the question? Uh, is there I did not get the question. Is there a mechanism with CO that allows you to have a master slave setup, or is that only possible with a rail, stor rail storage? Yeah. Um, is Christian Toyni there? Is he at the conference? Uh, which Christian? Toyni? Uh, yes, but he's not in the room. So I would ask him, I mean, he would know uh, much better about that. They were working on something for that. Um, it has a commercial product uh, that does do replication. Um, those are the only two um, projects that I know of. I do know of uh, some people who actually 
um, do, I mean, it depends on your use case, but I know some people who actually kind of do a fake replication using SCP uh, with file storage. Um, it's pretty crazy, but it works. It's, it's, it's for a government agency. It works really, really quite well. Um, and they just SCP the, uh, uh, the, the, the delta between, um, uh, 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 between the master and slave uh, Zio client. And that works fairly well, but it's quite manual. It's not a, and, and it depends on your application. It's not, um, it's not a, you sort of have to roll it a little bit yourself. So the answer is, I guess, no, there's not something that's equivalent to the application or of that caliber or out of the box with Zio, other than if you buy the solution from Zoke Corp or talk to Christian Toney about uh, the solution that they were working on. Okay, any other questions? None that I see so far. Um, okay, uh, should we switch to, to video? Can you switch on your video so we can pr say properly goodbye? At yeah, least? yeah, one, one second. Um, I have to shrink my windows and where is it at? Ah, there you go. That's me. And where, is you? where are you? I don't see you. Ah, oh, here you are. Hey! Okay, we're these two little guys <laughs> over there. Maybe I switch mine off. Okay, uh, there you are. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thanks for taking the time that's such early in the morning. Um, I hope you, um, I'm, I'm really sorry that it didn't, uh, man we, we were trying to send him a, a bottle of Bavarian beer, of German beer, uh, and I, <laughs> I spent like one and a half hours on the phone and had 20 phone calls to Texas, and in, in the end it turned out that it's just so extremely illegal to send beer within the United States. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it might be easier to send guns, I'm, I'm not sure. Didn't try that. <laughs> um, so well, thank you guys. Much. I yeah. Have a have a good day uh, and stay productive as you are. And uh, I hope to see you at the next international con conference in Netherlands. Okay. Bye bye. I certainly will. Yeah. You great. guys have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.